Hello, and welcome to the second part of my introduction to biodiversity. In the last video, I mentioned that life is divided into prokaryotes and eukaryotes. I showed you that all of life is classified into six kingdoms, and I talked a bit about the two kingdoms of the prokaryotes. In this video, I want to give you a brief tour of the four kingdoms of the eukaryotes. First, I'll show you the productista, which are all eukaryotes that are neither plants, nor animals, nor fungi. The productista are either unicellular, meaning an organism that consists of only one cell, or they form colonies, and some species are multicellular, but they're always rather simple organisms. In the selection of productista I'm about to show you, I made sure to cover all the major lineages. This is a single-celled protist with the beautiful name Giardia lamblia. But it's not so beautiful to have inside of your gut, as I can attest from experience. Giardia lamblia and other diplomonads are very special because each unicellular individual has two nuclei. Euglena has chloroplasts, but they are different from the chloroplasts that plants have. This unicellular organism belongs to the ciliates. A famous member of the group is paramecium. Ciliates have cilia, which they can use either for moving around or, in this case, for creating a flow of water that can bring food to the cell. This is the skeleton of a radiolarian, another group of unicellular productists. These skeletons come in many different shapes. And I'm always fascinated by the fact that a single cell can make such a complicated skeleton. Isn't it amazing? Diatoms are another group that forms skeletons around their cells. Brown algae, like this kelp shown here, are also part of Productista. Even though it really looks like a plant, it is not a plant, and not even very closely related to them. It is much more closely related to the unicellular diatoms that you just saw the skeletons of. The next two groups I'm going to show you, the amoebas and the slime molds, are part of a group that is thought to be closely related to the group containing the fungi and animals. Here you can see an amoeba, and close to the bottom of the picture you can clearly see the nucleus. This is a slime mold. They're usually unicellular, but when food is scarce, they can group together and form bodies like these shown here that are capable of producing spores for reproduction. So, these were just a few representatives of the Productista. Now we're left with the three kingdoms we're most familiar with, the plantae, the fungi, and the animalia. By the way, scientists dealing with plants are called botanists. Those dealing with fungi are called mycologists. And scientists doing research on animals are zoologists. When it comes to plants, there's some disagreement over which groups should be counted as plants and which ones shouldn't. Or, in other words, which organismal groups should be called plantae. In the narrowest sense, or sensu strictissimo, the kingdom plantae is equated with the group called land plants. In the narrow sense, or sensu strictu, plantae is equated with the viridi plantae, or the green plants, which is land plants plus green algae. And in the broad sense, sensu lato, plantae is taken to be equal to archaeplastida, which is green plants plus glaucophyte algae plus red algae. For the purpose of this video, I've selected this, this latter view, Plantae Sensulato. As you can see, the classification of organisms into groups can be rather confusing. Anyhow, let's have a quick look at some of these groups. Rhodophytes, or red algae, get their red color from accessory pigments in their chloroplasts. Most of them are multicellular and macroscopic, like the one here in the picture. Individuals of chlorophytes, or green algae, can be unicellular or multicellular, as you can see in these two photos. Land plants are, you guessed it, primarily terrestrial, meaning they live on land. Some land plants are secondarily aquatic, meaning they have evolved to go back to the water, like this species of buttercup, 
which you could confuse with algae if it wasn't for the flowers sticking out of the water. This is a fungus. More precisely, it's the fruiting body of a fungus, which is the equivalent of a fruit on a tree. The main part of the fungus are the hyphens underground, which are like very thin threads forming a network in the soil. You can get an idea what these hyphens look like when you look at those of this mold here. In this case, the fruiting bodies are the little black balls. Fungi play an important part in ecosystems as decomposers of dead organic matter. Other fungi can form a symbiosis with the roots of vascular plants. The symbiosis is called a mycorrhiza. They are very important for maintaining the health and functioning of many ecosystems. The fly agaric is a mycorrhizal fungus. There are different kinds of mycorrhiza. Here you can see a buscular mycorrhiza in which the fungus actually enters the cells of the vascular plant. The last kingdom is the animals. They are also called metazoa. You might not have thought of sponges as animals, although perhaps the TV series Spongebob might have changed that impression. Either way, sponges are some of the most simple animals we know. Comb jellies are also very simple animals. Jellyfish and comb jellies used to be thought of as very closely related, but are now assumed to be separate branches in the tree of life. Jellyfish are more closely related to anemones and corals, like the one shown here. This is Trichoplax, a very strange and very simple animal. It is flat as a pancake and consists of a group of cells banded together that can slowly move over surfaces. When it encounters something to eat, it glides over the food particle so that it covers it, then exudes liquid with enzymes which digest the food and then the nutrients are taken up by the cells of Trichoplax. Now, as a zoologist, I would love to show you the entire kingdom Animalia, but then I'd be needing a few more hours for this video, because on this planet there are, to put it with Charles Darwin, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful. I just want to show you one more animal species. This is the deadliest and most dangerous of all of them because it has the potential and the power to wipe out all species on Earth. I'm talking about Homo sapiens, of course. Scientifically, humans are animals, just like they are primates, mammals, and vertebrates. In Module 6 of this MOOC, we're going to explain how this one animal species threatens life on this planet, and in Module 7 and 8, we're going to talk about what some members of the species are doing and what you can do to limit the damage. In this in the previous video, I showed you a bit of the anatomical and morphological diversity of the major groups of life. And I mentioned the functional diversity, meaning what they do for a living. As I previously mentioned, there are also other aspects you can observe about biodiversity and some of my colleagues are going to talk about those in the second lesson of this module. But first, Owen is going to explain what biodiversity science is. You'll see me again in the next module. See you there. Have a good week. Bye.